Well, good evening, everybody. That was path- I know it's cold. I know it's rainy, but good night, people. How y'all doing? Good, good. Full, yes, very full. So um, a round of applause for both Dee and Elizabeth. Great meal. Um, for those of you who could not be here, we don't have a smell of vision yet. It was good. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Very sweet of you all to do that for us. Um, so thank you all for coming again as we continue, but we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, one or two quick announcements. Um, just became, uh, we just became aware of this. Um, Emily had busted her hump hours spent making this double-sided color uh, flyer that was supposed to go in with everybody's uh, year-end giving statements. It talks about where all the money went, you know, great things that we did, like uh, the Comfort Sewers gave away 1,500 gifts, Soup for the Soul, 350 containers, you know, we gave out $3,000, over $3,000 in benevolence, 455 pounds of food. Santa Claus, I think, yes, and, and Santa's helper elf is on there, and the trip to Louisiana for the hurricane recovery, and um, the guys, the herd, uh, my affectionate men's group, um, doing a fish fry for one of our events. That's all on there. So anyway, somehow we miscommunicated and did not get put into the, or most of the envelope. So I apologize. So these are for you to take home, and we'll be giving them out again on Sunday for those who aren't here. Um, but it just gives you a quick synopsis of everything we did last year as a church, um, even through the pandemic and the quarantine. Did anybody get that in their giving statement? Yeah. No, but did you get that flyer in there? Yeah, that's, that's what I was asking. Cody, did you get yours? What? A giving statement? Oh, that was mailed out long ago. <laughs> he sounded like me. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so with that, uh, we are now uh, just about, believe it or not, half, half of the book. You'd almost think that by now, especially once we get through 11, that the story's been told. Oh, but oh no, there's still 11 more chapters to go of some very good stuff. Um, does ha- anybody have any questions that have popped up over these weeks, especially two weeks ago when we went over all those, the first six trumpets and the, all the imagery? the horses with lion's heads and serpent tails of scorpions that would not kill anybody but would torture them for how long? I could live with five minutes. <laughs> Nothing? Okay. Um, today we're going to, uh, like I said, go over 10 and 11. Um, you probably hear me say this a couple or three times tonight. The book of Revelation is a puzzling book to begin with, but nothing is probably, at least to me, as puzzling as the first half of the first 14 verses of chapter 11. So we're going to kind of go through it pretty quickly through a lens of several commentators, Uh, but there's no doubt if you were to do any kind of a search, those 14 verses, first 14 verses of chapter 11, there are probably as many interpretations as there are scholars, and it's hotly debated. So if you're looking for a clear-cut answer, there just isn't one. Well, for the whole book, but especially those 14 verses. So, but we'll get into that um, in a moment. And there was something else. Um, there was a health concern. It just got brought to my attention. No. Uh, Robert, do you know anything? Still don't know? Yeah. That's got to be the for a parent, especially. That's scary. And grandparent. Wow. All right. 
cool. The kitchen crew is done. I'm done stalling. Good. All right. So uh, let's kick it. So uh, verse uh, chapter 10 basically is talking about, at least my Bible, the NSRV, describes it as uh, the angel with the little scroll. Okay, so, um, and as you can see by these renderings, uh, this ain't no ordinary angel. By, well, nothing in Revelation is ordinary, but this thing is extra ordinary. That's one uh, artist's rendition. Um, this one I kind of like more. Um, and I'll get into that in, in a moment. But this is just how John writes. A lot of hyperbole, a lot of symbolism, and we got to be able to just press on and, and miss the bigger picture of the bottomless pit from two weeks ago. Remember that? We talked about the bottomless pit, talking about it's not what goes in at the files, but what comes out at the files and what came out of the bottomless pit, those horrible, horrible man-torturing locusts. So reading <clears throat> um, verse 10, this is out of the NSRV. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud. What should that remind you of right there? Wrapped in a cloud. What? I'm sorry. Shroud? Christ in what sense? Okay, but Christ in what sense? Well, what two stories really talk about a cloud? Transfiguration, bingo, bango, bongo, and one more? The ascension, bingo, perfect, all right? So those are all kind of things. Remember, one of the ways writers, even today, solidify their arguments, solidify their case, give more a firm foundation to what they're saying is a reference of their scriptures, um, especially the New Testament, but especially even in, in the Old Testament. But these two are talking more or less about the, the New Testament. Coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. What two big things should come to mind with that one? Rainbow. Not the Rainbow Coalition. What? God's promise to Noah, right? And chapter 1, how was the throne described? There was a rainbow over the throne. Remember that in chapter 1? I think it's verse 7, um, I think, if memory serves me correctly. Um, face like the sun. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Curtis. Perfect. That's right. Ezekiel 7. That's in there as well. Cloud of heaven. Jesus or faith? Jesus. And it's important for, for these stories, especially in, in chapter 11 coming up. So face like the sun, again, transfiguration. It should come right to your mind. And we just had that as a story on, on Sunday because it says, and his face shone. That's why I like this picture more than that picture because, number one, it's huge. You've got legs on fire, pillows are fire, which we'll get to in a moment. But his face is like the sun. You can't, you can't see his face, which you wouldn't be able to if his face was like the sun, and he's got the rainbow over and above him. Um, like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. Pillars of fire bring you back to? In the desert, In the, desert the Exodus story. Big story. Pillars of fire. So we got all these images tap, tied into these few words and verses, and, and John's just a magnificent writer pulling in all this symbolism and all this imagery just like that, always referencing Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit or some variation thereof. He held in his hand a little scroll open in, I'm sorry, he held a little scroll open in his hand. So remember way back when we first started and I asked you to watch that video on the first 11 chapters of Revelation as an overview? And I said, anybody who finds a mistake in it, I'll give $10 to, with the exception of Cody. Did anybody find it? This was it. Because they were, and, and if I may be so bold, there are other scholars who say that this little scroll is the same as the scroll that's just been unsealed, uh, the one that was on, in, in God's hand on the throne. It had the seven seals on it. I, I lean more towards it's not for lots of reasons. The biggest one being is, is that the, 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 the Greek word scroll used this time as compared to earlier in chapter to, to, to one 
They're different words. So why would he use different words if it's the same scroll? So foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. This angel has domain and um, dominion over everything, land and sea. He gave a great shout like a lion roaring. And when he shouted, the seven thunders sounded. So when you're all study, what did you find out about the seven thunders? Except for the cooks. Bingo. Could be. Mm-hmm. Seven is a number of completeness, correct, perfection. What else might it be? Folks, no one knows. There's a lot of guesses, but no one, it could even be the seven seals. Well, I got to trick you once in a while. Come on, Teresa. I, mean, I got to have some fun. <laughs> the sons of thunder, but again, it's one of those things who has, is surrounded by a cloud, who's got a rainbow around them, and his face is like the sun, and he's got pillars of fire for legs, and he's got one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. Again, this ain't no ordinary angel. And when we speak, and he gave a great shout, like a lion roaring. Where else in Revelation, a subtle hint, chapter 1, did we hear, or chapter 2, 2, did we hear about a lion? In describing Jesus, he speaks, we have this lion roaring words that come out of the lion's mouth, or the angel's mouth, I mean, which is the Messiah, the lion lamb. Both images wrapped in the one. The seven thunders, whatever fits your theology. <clears throat> And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. We have no idea what that is. We have no idea what John's alluding to. At least I wasn't able to find anything, and I looked. So the seven thunders could be the seven seals. It could be a, just a number of perfection. The thunder is also often used as an, a metaphor for the voice of God. On and on and on. Then the angel who I'm saw standing on the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven, which means now the scroll, if it wasn't before, is now in his left hand, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, swearing by God, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is, is it, There'll be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Chapter 10 is what's called in the book of Revelation study as an interlude. We had one of those before. Remember at the sixth seal, we're getting all ready and cranked up for the seventh seal, and what happens? Silence. Remember that? The very next verse is, and there was silence. Well, here, we're getting all cranked up for the, hey, Marcia, all cranked up for the seventh trumpet to be blown, and we have chapter 10, which is known as an interlude, an in-between. So we're still waiting for the seventh trumpet to be blown. I had heard from heaven, spoke to me again, saying, go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land, so I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll, which I always found was a, bit, a little bit cheeky, because if that angel is looking that kind of or, ornery and extraordinary and that big, I'm not going to tell him to do anything. I might ask for it, but I ain't going to tell him. Um, he said, take it and eat it. It will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. So what does that possibly bring you back to? What? One of the prophets, okay, which one? Mm -hmm. Anybody remember which prophet that was? What? Nope. 
Ezekiel, there you go. See, I can kiss you. <laughs> I'm not going to kiss David. <laughs> yeah, so if you go back to Ezekiel in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, you're going to read almost verbatim the same, but in his stomach it was bitter. What do you think he means by that? He liked it, but was convicted by it. Excellent. What else? The news that's coming is not going to be well received. Exactly right. So it's going to taste good going down, you know. But who else had bitter words to share with the people? And he's known as the weeping Jeremiah. Jeremiah, everyone's favorite prophet, because he was so full of good news all the time. Um, so, what, so what goes in doesn't defile. What comes out defiles, and what comes out of them was bitter. Not defilement, but bitter because it was about redemption and about repentance and about piety. <clears throat> so I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me again, this is John's commissioning ceremony, if you will, his inauguration. He is now a prophet. He is to prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Why do you think he had to eat? What's the, symb the, symb the symbology? Is that a word? What is the symbolism of eating the scroll? Absorption, okay? Ingesting it. If you're going to be a prophet, you not only have to know the word, you have to be part of it through absorption or ingestion. Or, but it has to be more than just words. It has to be part of your being, part of your fiber. Okay, now we get to um, 11. This is beginning of 11, I believe. Um, this is where it gets really puzzling, especially these next 14 verses. Like I said, we're going to go through them kind of quickly, um, just so we can get through 11, and then we'll come back to it and spend a lot of time, because there is so much packed into this. Um, so, um... And I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Who else was told to do that in the Old Testament? All of you who study Bibles, it's got to be in your notes. Hmm? Elijah? Nope. Somebody? Get old Ezekiel. Ezekiel. He was told to measure and measure and measure. Um, so there I'm just going to measure rod and staff. Come and measure the temple of God and worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out for it is given over to the nations and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. Again, we're going to go through this pretty, pretty quickly. 42 months, what did, you, what did you find out about that number? Three and a half years, which is, what's the number three and a half on your number cheat sheets? Limited time. Half of seven, half perfection, or even imperfection. So that, that's what the 42 is about, which is three and a half years, or 1,260 days. It's also tied into, if you, if you look into it, the period of harassment that Daniel talks about in chapter 7. So, it's not going to last forever. It's going to be limited to something. Is it literally three and a half years? No. But it's a limited time. We don't know what it is. But it's not literally three and a half years. It's just a limited amount of time. Um, let's see. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy. Anybody got any guesstimations why two witnesses? It's 
probably referring to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19, when it was talking about the law and the need for witnesses. And to go to court, you had to have at least two witnesses or more. But you had to have at least two to, in order for you to go to court. Um, to, 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 to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. And what is sackcloth always a, a, a symbol for in, in the Bible? Weeping, mourning, not a good day. Uh, these two, they are the olive, two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And that's a direct, almost quote from uh, Zechariah uh, 4, 11 through 14. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? And the second time I said to him, what are these two branches of the olive tree which pour out the oil through two golden pipes? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Everything that John's writing, especially in this chapter, is just a reference to something else, something else, and something else. And the inhabitants of the, whoops, what happened? So I should go to my Bible now? Huh? I don't remember. <laughs> well, they're not numbered up here, so I don't know. 11-4. <laughs> there we go. Or if they are numbered, I can't see that far. Uh, let's see. And if uh, anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouth, a.k.a. very similar to the images from two weeks ago, and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner, which also refers back to that same passage regarding witnesses. If you make false witness, happened to the person who was making false witness. They have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So from that, who do you think the two witnesses are that John's referring to? Plagues. Plague, plagues. What's plagues? Just, 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 just Moses. There you go. When you hear plagues, just think Moses. It's always Moses. So a uh, Moses and Elijah. Right answer. But why Elijah? Remember when he was at the altar combating Ahab, and he had a big drought, and uh, they had a contest between Elijah's God and you know Baal, and um, they tried to light everything on fire, and they couldn't get a fire going. And Elijah had them pour water and water and water over everything, and he burnt the sticks, and he burnt the rocks. You also think, as Robert said, it's Enoch. So, but most folks believe it's Elijah and Moses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a perfectly legitimate and logical... It just, mm -hmm. it just don't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. Our God would say, well, all right, you just want to die again. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. He set me up to do that. Mm -hmm. That's what was going to happen. They're going to die and lay in the road and be in the city for three and a half days. Mm -hmm. so, it's a great argument. You think about it, you know, he's going to have a He's only mentioned in there seven times that he's in the whole Bible. And that's just way back in the world. A Billy Graham. <laughs> well, I just no slouch either. Um, but you, you shine plenty. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's, he's definitely one of the three that, that I thought of. 
Okay, um, when they finished their testimony, the beast that comes from the bottomless pit, remember the bottomless pit from two weeks ago, will make war on them and conquer them. Kind of a spoiler. I mean, who was expecting that when they first read this or heard this, that the two witnesses of God would be conquered by the beast, which we find, find out later is, is Satan or evilness. And their dead bodies will lie in the street on the of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. There's a lot there, folks. And we'll spend a little bit of time going over right now, but more later. Um, Sodom. Well, first of all, uh, leaving their bodies not buried for three and a half days, which again, we know, I doubt very much it was three and a half days. Some limited amount of time, but when enemies wanted to shame the people they conquered, they would not bury their bodies. It was, it was the height of shamefulness to not have your, body, your, your corpse buried. So this was highly shameful activity on behalf of the beast and the beast minions. But getting to, to Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified, In both cities, innocent blood was shed, and God's people were harassed. Um, now, the majority of scholars identify this city as Jerusalem. Not all of them by any means, and it's a slim majority at, at all. Others believe that John is talking about Rome. Um, again, it's one of those things we just don't know. There's good arguments um, for both. Now, the name Sodom is actually applied to describing Jerusalem in Isaiah chapter 1 and Jeremiah chapter 23 and Ezekiel 16, linking Jerusalem and by default Rome to spots are connected there. Egypt is associated with idolatry, all the different gods they had and everything else, and is a land from which God delivered his enslaved people, Israel. So, that's kind of the imagery that he's setting up. That's going to become even more powerful in chapters 12 and 13. Uh, let's see. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb, the height of shame. And the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. Aren't we just nice people? And celebrate and exchange presents even. It's Christmas because these two prophets had been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. How are they a torment? They were telling the truth. They were being Jeremiah. You know, they were just being Jeremiah. They were just telling it like it is. They were telling it like they were told to tell it by God. And folks, that ain't fun. And that ain't easy, and I'm sure we've all been there one way or another. But they tormented them in that manner by speaking truth, God's truth of the earth. The glory, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and those who saw them were terrified. What imagery is that bringing up? Walking dead. Zombie land, 2.0. <laughs> Ezekiel, again, the valley of the dried bones, where God breathed into them new life after putting the sin on the corpses. So it's a direct link to Ezekiel in the valley of the dried bones. Then he heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. So not only have they been raised from the dead, they have been exalted and are being brought up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. That's the verse we're going to spend a lot of time on. The second woe has passed. Only the second. The third woe is coming very soon. But does it ever come? Most scholars say no. There is a slight hint, possibly maybe, in, in, uh, ver in chapter 12, verse 12, 
where it reads, Rejoice then, you heavens and those who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. That could be the third woe, but it's not anywhere near as explained as the first two woes are. Then the seventh angel, finally we get the seventh trumpet being blown. And what does it bring you right back to? Hopefully, possibly, chapters 4 and 5, because these last four verses, 15 through 19, it's just all singing and praise and glory to God and everything else. So it kind of ends on a high note. And then the 24 elders are sitting in the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, singing, we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty. This should remind you of all the, the praise songs that we read in chapters 4 and 5, who were for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Is that the end of the chapter? Seven, oh, 17. The nations rage, but your wrath has come in the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And God's temple in heaven was opened. And look at this, the Ark of the Covenant. Glory be Megorshan. Where has that been? Was seen within the temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. That's it. Okay, so looking at, again, this is a puzzling book. I'm going back to 11 verses 1 through 14. Uh, Without a doubt, these are the most puzzling verses. Um, What's it all about? What What are these verses all about? Well, at one level, it's quite clear. I mean, first of all, the first part of the vision is John is told to come out and measure the temple, correct? And then we have the two witnesses emerge doing all kinds of great and kind of be it strange deeds before being killed, shamefully left unburied, but then they're raised to new life and exalted to heaven. You see, these these 14 verses, there's a different voice, a different tone, if you will, in my opinion, to to John's writing. It's quite different from what's before it and what's after it. Because instead of the -the over-the-top and epic big picture scenes that we just left, you know, the terrifying horsemen, the man-torturing locusts, the sulfur-breathing horses from two weeks ago with heads like lions, and they had scorpion tails that they would torture humanity with, and all the rest, we seem to have this short story about these two witnesses. It's a very strange story, but it's about two specific individuals and their fate. So this has got to mean something, and, and it has to fit in with the rest of the book. I mean, how does this, this force agree as to what it all means throughout history? You can find books, libraries of books, just on these 14 verses. But through all of my research and all of my reading, and what makes the most sense to me, this is kind of the vision that I kind of lean towards about what John is talking about in these verses. You may not agree with it, and that is fine. Because again, this is interpretation, and these are bizarre, strange verses, and we don't know some of the things like the thunders. We don't know exactly what that is. But this is what I lean to because it makes sense looking at the entirety of You've heard me say before that our image of God greatly affects how we read the Bible. Our image of God greatly affects what we pull and how we interpret God's word from the Bible. And if, you, if your theology, and I'm not being judgmental, I'm not pointing fingers, and again, as always, folks, I never want to hurt or damage anyone's personal theology. I'm just telling you what I believe based on a lot of research. Um, I hate when that happens. Brain died. Um, Truly, truly is. But just listen. Listen with an open mind. Listen with an open heart. Because if you 
read the Bible through a lens of a belief in fearing God, fear in the sense of frightened or be afraid, versus eyes of fearing God in the lens of love and reverence and awe. You're going to get two totally different understandings of who God is from the Bible, let alone from these verses. So, first, John's measuring of the text, in my personal opinion, has got nothing to do with the temple of Jerusalem. And there are books written saying that it is the temple of Jerusalem, and I don't think it is. And I don't, I don't think it's referring to the throne room back in chapters 4 and 5. And again, the, the scholars disagree with me. So why do I think this? Because by the time of John's writing, and this was true from very early on in Christianity, Christians had come to see themselves as the true temple. They began to see themselves as the place where God... It's very prevalent in early Christianity, that shift from a brick-and-mortar temple to the body being a temple. Now, Ezekiel's measuring of his visionary temple in uh, chapter 40 of his, of his book was a way of marking out a place where God was going to come and dwell. John's marking out this place, but he's marking it out in the human temple, this community, the seven churches that he's written to. And it's a way of signaling God's solemn intention. But what is the task? What is the role of his people, of this people, whose body is their temple. And this, to me, even though these verses are quite puzzling and perplexing, this, to me, goes to the heart of what John is trying to do through this apocalyptic letter. Remembering its historical context about emperor worship, emperor worship, and getting the mark on your hands so you can go buy and sell things in the market, and all that historical context, all of God's people is to bear witness to Jesus, even though it may mean suffering, even though it might possibly mean death. That is the crux and the heart of John's message throughout the entire book. The seven letters continually promise, if you remember reading those, continually promise special rewards to those who conquered. And we talked about conquering, meaning that his people conquered him rather than face compromise. And this is tough to hear, I get that. But this is, it makes the most sense to me in the warp and weft of the Bible and in this letter as well. And this is the part even more, yes ma'am. Give me one second. Give me one second. Almost there. Okay. Good question. She was asking about the Gentiles. Um, and this is, if you thought that part was hard to hear, this part's going to be even more difficult. Whole church and its prophetic witness and its faith, faithful death and vindication by God. Many commentators and scholars believe the two witnesses are a symbol of the whole church with their witness, their death, and their vindication by God. The church as a whole, and I'm not just making this up, always verify, the church as a whole is symbolized by the lampstands that we read in chapter 11, but they refer also back to chapter 1, verse 20, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The church is to proph prophesy clothed in sackcloth as a sign of mourning for the wickedness of the world and the evil that will bring onto itself. The church is going to mourn because of all the evil that it will bring upon itself. Think that might be happening today? Why two witnesses? Well, outside of what we talked about, about Deuteronomy and the need for two witnesses and that link to the Old Testament again, 
I think it has more to do with the other thing we talked about regarding the two witnesses. And I totally get Enoch, and that's a great argument, and I could be totally wrong, but I lean more towards Elijah and Moses. Again, Moses, who stood up to Pharaoh, the pagan king of Egypt, and demonstrated God's power by the plagues, which, as we have seen, are already echoed, or have been echoed in chapters 8 and 9. In the story of Elijah again, who stood up to Ahab, the paganizing king of Israel, and demonstrated God's power by successfully praying for a drought and then by calling down fire from heaven. Now, contrary to some, I don't believe and I don't think turn and carry out what we just read in chapter 11. I, I don't believe that. I believe it's symbolism. I believe it's metaphor. I believe he's trying to tie his points into these well-known stories of prophet, prophetic heroes to make his point. So, no, I don't believe that Moses and Elijah are actually going to come back and do these things. Rather, I think what John is saying is that the church, following the great tradition of Moses and Elijah, the church will perform powerful signs. And at the climax of the church's work, the climax of her work will be her up from the abyss, as in that chapter. And who is the monster? And what is the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord is crucified? Well, in the following chapters, 12 and 13 especially, we learn that the monster is the might of the empire, any empire. But for this context, it's embodied by Rome, and that the city is Rome itself, or perhaps even the entire Roman Empire. But you see, here's, here's the point, the point that John has determined for us, the God-given and God-protected vocation to bear their faithful witness will not mean we will be spared from suffering and death. Rather, the suffering and death itself, like that of Jesus, will be the ultimate prophetic sign which the world will be brought to glorify God. So, where are the Gentiles? They're the ones who are mocking us. They're the Nicolaitans that we read of in chapter 2 the ones who supported the empire, who said this emperor god, Domitian or Nero, whichever one it might be, get that stamp so you can get into the market and buy and sell your goods, you gotta take care of your family. Supporting the empire and empire worship. And that's gonna happen for how long? Three and a half days, whatever that might be. So those who don't succumb to that temptation, it's gonna be suffering. And there might be death. And I'm not saying that I think John is right. That's just what John is trying to say, I think. So let me read that last part again. <clears throat> the point to bear faithful witness does not mean that life won't kick us and knock us down. I think we all can testify to that. Rather, the suffering and death itself, like that of Jesus, will be the ultimate prophetic sign through which the world will be brought to glorify God. And how does it work? For three and a half days, or some incomplete amount of time, the world will celebrate a victory over the church. But suddenly, as we read, God will act in a new way. In the visions of Ezekiel 37, of God will come into reality, will be a real thing. This vindication of the church will complete the prophetic witness. The result will be that the world, looking on the Gentiles, will at last be converted. This, I believe, is the meaning of the powerful language at the end of verse 13, but it's hard because of the wording at the end of verse 13, which reads, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. 
that the word fear, for example, as in fear the Lord, does not equate to our understanding of afraid or frightened, but more towards the understanding of a reverend awe. Its other definitions, the Greek word for fear, are respect, reverence, and believe it or not, piety. But we never think of that when we hear that word fear. It's similar to the Greek word translated here as terrified, so the same rules would apply, I think. But let's just have some common sense. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. How can you give glory? How can you love, honestly, if you're frightened to death of them? You can't. You just, you just can't. How can one give glory? How can one give love, honor, respect to someone that they are frightened of? Literally, bone-shaking frightened of. Contrary to this notion of people coming in fear and trembling to glorify or a temporary and begrudging acknowledgement of God's sovereignty. Sure, if God wants me to honor him and worship him because I'm scared to death of him, sure, I'll do it. But I'm not going to have my soul in it. I'm not going to have my all in it. I'm just going to do it just enough so that I can sneak away or get away somehow or just not get killed or whatever it might be. How can you gl bring glory to someone or something if you are frightened, which means you don't love them? How can you love that which you're frightened of, terrified of in that word? Because they now have reverend awe towards God. They aren't shaking in their boots, terrified of God, and for that reason are worshiping him. So one way to put this, as one author did, the martyred witness of the church, love, sacrifice, will succeed where the plagues have failed. Violence. Love conquers violence because love conquers. All these horrible things happening and people still wouldn't turn towards God. In fact, I remember one of you shouting out the answer that and they still wouldn't worship or they still were sinning or they still were stiff-necked. Gotta have love. Gotta have love. And so even though you might be risking suffering, even though you might be risking lacking, even though you possibly be difficult in this country, but it's possible, risk your own life by not bending knee to the empire, whatever that might mean to you, doesn't just mean we are not to bend. We are not to live contrary. So this is how, in my opinion, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, as we read. And I think that's precisely the point in those last few verses, 15 through 19, all that worshiping and all that singing and praise and glory, because they were head over heels and loved God, God with God. They weren't frightened of him. They were in love with him. In this most puzzling books, turns out to be one of the most important and central statements of what John wants to say to the churches he's writing to. And we should not mistake the powerful impact of the symbolism in that short verse, verse 13, when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom was so, and Gomorrah was so sinful that God decided to just basically wipe them out. And what did Abraham do? He bartered with him, talked God down. Love that about Abe. And he got him down and down, and they get down to 10. And if you remember what, what, what was written in chapter 11, about if we only spare the, the city if the 10 righteous persons were found, but now, however, only one-tenth of the wicked city is to fall, and nine-tenths will be saved. Whereas before, 
only one-tenth was going to be saved, and nine-tenths were going to be destroyed. It's a flip-flop. So hold that balloon. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, were left who had not bowed the knee to the pagan god Baal. Now, however, according to what we just read, or was in chapter 11, 7,000 who are killed, but the great majority are to be rescued. It's a flip-flop. So instead of one-tenth being saved and nine-tenths being killed, and instead of only 7,000 surviving, only 7,000 will be killed, we have this. Out of all this smoke, smoke, I think, at least for me, a vision of the Creator God as a God of mercy. Nine-tenths versus all. Seven thousand versus all. Grieving over the rebellion and corruption of the world, but determined to rescue and restore it. God ain't giving up on us. And doing so through the faithful death of the Lamb, and now through the faithful death of the Lamb's prophetic followers, us. The way stands That's what I think those 14 verses are doing. Pointing us towards a vision of a God to love, of a God that won't give up on us, of a God full of mercy and second chances and patience, and not a God of fear in the sense of being frightened of or afraid. And even though this was written thousands of years ago, obviously, what empire are we worshiping? What qualities in our everyday lives? That's up to you to decide. We all do it. We may not know it, and we never talk about it because you just don't do those things in polite society. What did it say about them tormenting? That's what I think is the crux of John's message throughout the entirety of the book. Following God's going to cost. Being a disciple is going to cost. And it ain't going to be easy. And even though it's often like honey, sometimes you the nudger and the pusher and the poker talking about repentance and not bending the knee to anything but God all the time. So, that's my take on those 14 chapters. 14 verses, sorry. Comments, thoughts, questions? Hang on, can I, can I give you this mic? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, when David was talking about being afraid and fearful, but in awe and reverence, and the boy and his horse, um, the little horse uh, was coming up and had fur and met the lion, which is God, right? The lion, uh, Aslan, was God. And the little pony, um, then I just want to read you this quote. Then Han, though shaking all over, gave she said, You're so beautiful. You may eat me if you'd like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. That was perfect. But is it easy to say, hey, you know what, Cody? I'd rather be eaten by you than fed by anybody else. We're called to live in as witnesses and disciples of our one true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If it was easy, everybody do it. It's not. And quite frankly, sometimes... I probably shouldn't use that word. Um, it's not fun. But at the end, it's the only way to true happiness, true wholeness, 
perfect seven. Anybody else? Now, I know for some of you, that's okay. Just sleep on it, live with it, think about it for a while. What do you got to lose? Fear God, yes, but in reverent awe, not in being frightened or afeared, as they say. Amen. Oops. So thank you all for coming. Uh, We'll do next week, uh, 12 and 13. I'm going to put a link on our Facebook page and our web page, second half. Um, It's about the same length that goes through chapters 12 and 22. It's very rapid, but you can always pause it and back up and and hear it again. Um, But we're probably going to start off playing that video, but I would recommend listening to it a couple or three times before next Wednesday. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the ability to listen. We thank you for giving us the gift of being born in a country where we can have these conversations without fear of losing our lives. That cannot be said for John's original audience, nor can it be said for everyone who even currently lives right now to you. Help us to have the wisdom to see through the vehicles of propaganda that mask the evil that lurks everywhere. But God, right now, just be with us as we try and be with you. Bring everyone home safely. Bring everyone awake tomorrow, full of energy, full of love, and full of curiosity for you. And dear God, we just thank you once again for your son and for the gift of the Holy Spirit as your covenant promise to dwell in praise. Amen. If you would, just kind of stack the chairs up about six high, and we'll get the dollies out and roll them over, and just roll the tables over to right there. We'll get everything put away. Thank you all very much. And Dee and Elizabeth again, fabulous dinner.